Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to be more empowered in your own skin, then do we have the Divine Feminine Show for you. Today I'll be talking with best-selling author and scholar of the Divine Feminine, Megan Watterson, who has a Master's of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, a Master's of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary, and is the author and creator of an empowering new set of oracle cards, the Divine Feminine. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about getting spiritually naked, comfortable in your own skin, and discovering just how much divine love you have inside of you. That, plus we'll talk about Carl Jung in the BBC, rowing without <laughs> oars, Carly and Shiva, the power of the color red, bolting from airplanes, Patrick Swayze and the light, what in the world is the happy floor, and what on earth unicorns and the Met has to do with anything. <laughs> Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Megan. Are you ready to shine? Yes, apparently I am. <laughs> I'm sweating from that introduction, so. Excellent accent. It's all downhill. Is that the right way to put it? Oh, no. It's, it's all in a good direction from here. In fact, let's start with something fun. Who was the wild girl child? Uh, the wild girl child. That's the inner self, the part of me that had zero inhibitions and was absolutely fully embodied. And what I mean by that is that sensation of where sort of like a comforter is to a duvet cover. Mm -hmm. You're just fully inside yourself. There's no part of you that you're not occupying. There's no aspect also of your personality that you're afraid to express. You're just your inside is your outside. That's the wild girl child. That's how I would describe her. There's complete integrity, if you know what I mean. I like it. And it's, it's so, there's some sort of really strange synchronicity. We have a wild girl child kitty cat who has fully <laughs> embodied her divine feminine, and she is the tomboy of tomboys. And right before the interview, I had her on the duvet color cover, and I'm throwing her up and down and thinking about her for the interview. <laughs> so it was absolutely perfect. So if you don't mind me asking, you had a wild girl child in your youngest years. In fact, there's you in this pose from what I understand. Maybe you can right. tell, her about, uh, tell us about her and then what happened to her for a while. So I would say that girl was, well, she is me, but she was very in touch also, not just with her own emotions and feelings, but she was also in touch with who she was supported by that's unseen, mm -hmm. right? So like the unseen support, it was seamless for me at that age and at that time. It just, it was like, um, almost, almost like no matter where I went or who I was with, there was this, this feeling of love always surrounding me. And, um, when I was, uh, a little girl at a friend's house, I was sexually assaulted. And what that did to me, I mean, the, the depths of what I could describe that did on a physical level was it, it cut me off from that sense of there being this good, you know, capital G good, mm -hmm. and this energy of love, I felt I felt cut off from that. And also simultaneously, then I was cut off from feeling safe to express that wild girl child that that little love, you know, which, you know, the voice of love sometimes expresses itself with fire. It's a holy fire, you know, and indignation. Like you cross that little kitty cat and she's going to scratch you. <laughs> and there's something very sacred about that. Um, and I lost that ability to be able to honestly express when I was either happy or outraged. I just, you know, got uh, really severed from myself and also from that goodness that I had felt before that that sense of presence of love, a love that was too holy to even talk about, you know, love that was just there um, and felt. And I couldn't perceive it anymore after that. Thank you so much for sharing. What's powerful to me, though, is how it started, how the fire 
the, the fire was stoked and started to come out. I mean, Unitarian Church at age 10 with a guy teaching <laughs> about God. What happened? The poor man. The poor man. He was wonderful, too. The poor man. I still remember him. He was in socks and sandals, and he was just a sweet man. But for me, you know, him not knowing that that happened, you know, I didn't tell anyone. So how would he know? I was silent about all of that. But then walking into that situation where I was being told that God was a father and a father only, right? Like that God was male and masculine and that that is how God has been perceived for the majority of the world religions, right? For millennia. And there isn't this concept also of an equal she presence, right? Like a divine feminine, there's the divine masculine, but then there's You know, there's the father and the son, but where are the mother and the daughter? And that to me, because of what had happened, that felt dangerous. And it also felt connected. It felt like, okay, if we don't honor the fact that the divine is so much more than just a father, a father is everything and so crucial, but so is the mother. Like if we're going to anthropomorphize God at all, it feels, it felt significant to me that because we had only deified the male and the masculine, somehow that was translating into the female body getting misunderstood as somehow less than or disposable or objectified, you know? And so I felt like, where is the mother? That was the question that I went, but yeah, I broke out in hives. That's basically what happened because I wasn't able to like articulate at that age, everything that I know now and everything that I then became so passionate about finding out. Um, I just broke out into hives. I mean, it was not pretty. And I went running from the church (laughs) and never went back, not formally. So most people don't have that reaction to the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) You know what's cool though is we had on Alberto Violdo yesterday, and, oh, he did. and I love him. He's absolutely amazing, and he was talking about how the real ancient religions or practices, even the word religion, he would probably hesitate to use, right. were from the divine feminine. Right, right. I, I just was a part of his year of living sacred, and he speaks so much about the fact that the divine is embodied fully whether you're male or female or you know it really it it doesn't have anything to do with that and I think what I was coming up against as a as a little girl was that for my experience for me this was this was creating a cyclops in our vision of the divine we were only seeing one side of what it of 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 what it means to be God right we were only so we were like a cyclops and what we need is that other eye that can perceive the totality of what it means to be God. So let's go from, I can't believe we're going to say this, cyclopses to unicorns. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So I didn't know at that time when I was a teenager at the Met, I had no idea that there were these ancient correlations between Christ and the unicorn. I had no idea. And since I had left the church so completely, right, I didn't know much about Jesus other than, you know, some of the some of the rules around who can and cannot be Christian, right? Like my brother was gay and I believed that he was just as holy as anybody else, you know, like uh, those types of things. So I I didn't have a concept of Christ that would have been positive. I wasn't looking to find any Christology, right? I wasn't looking for Christ, but that unicorn moved me to tears. Um, the unicorn tapestries that, that were in the Met at that time, um, because it awoke something in me. When I was looking at the unicorn in the fence, I felt this stirring of, you know, I, I talked about that sense of a presence of love being around me and always protecting me and supporting me. Well, this was like that, but I felt like this, this door opened from inside my heart and that love that I thought had disappeared was actually inside me. And I was, I could feel it. And I could feel that like the unicorn with that fence, 
no one and nothing could ever touch that. Like that is this aspect of me that is eternal and that, you know, I, I feel like I know in my blood, in my bones, that there's something else. I don't know what there is, but I've had too many experiences. I studied near death experiences in college. I was fascinated by them. Um, so, so compelled by them. Um, but I just, it's, it, it felt like it was connected to that, like the aspect of me that goes on, that it, my ego can't comprehend, but that that the part of me that came into this life and that will go go forth, you know, with into whatever is next. I felt like because of looking at the unicorn and that to me was one of many initiations into uncovering who Christ, what what. You know, I'd never heard of something like Christ consciousness. I'd never heard of, I didn't even really know who Jesus was other than this idea of like, you know, the kind of puritanical, like, don't have same sex Jesus, you know, (laughs) like, I didn't know who he was. And that made me feel like in the same way, I don't know the whole story of what God is. I don't know the whole story of what Christ is. Right. Did that light the fire under you? Where was it as a child you're going, I need to know more? Yeah. Yes. I think what started lighting the fire, honestly, was um, hearing about, you know, I kind of had that savior complex for a while. Um, I, I threatened many times to, you know, starve myself like Gandhi, I, you know, until all children were being fed in the world. I had a very strong, well, it was, it was hard on my, my mom. Um, I wanted to, uh, go to India at one point because I found out about the, um, uh, you know, that the little girls, little baby girls were being discarded because of dowries and the, the way that the, the system is set up in terms of, you know, it being difficult on parents to have a daughter and afford a daughter. So there, so the orphanages were flooded with girls. So there was all of this desire to want to save little girls. Right. And I worked at a a center for children who had been abused. And what I began to realize was that I was trying to externalize the, the work I needed to do on, you know, my own healing process. Right. I was trying to save all of these little girls when the person who was, you know, literally crying out for me was that little girl who was assaulted. And so gratefully, because of, um, you know, amazing therapists and work when I was in college and I started studying these, you know, my own healing is inextricably linked to finding these stories like so many of the women that are in the divine oracle. Um, these are the saints and mystics that when I found them, like I would weep when I heard their stories, you know, and, um, recovering and finding their voices were integral to me finding my own, that voice that got lost the night I was assaulted. And so there was a parallel, um, between, uh, re, you know, figuring out where the mother went, where all these stories of the the female saints and mystics and gurus, you know, fi- uncovering their stories and then finding that voice of my own. And so ultimately I needed to go inward. And, you know, that's what every one of their stories is about, is that it's that, it's that something which is ineffable inside us in the heart that we crave foremost and that if we're lucky we realize that nothing else outside of us will satisfy thank you there's a an image burned into my brain um i think it's you in spain you're up on a hillside it's for <laughs> it's you've got god written next to your arm <laughs> yeah the hermitage yep yep maybe yeah you can exactly share about that. So I went on a pilgrimage uh, before entering a uh, Harvard Divinity School. I went on a pilgrimage to some of these sacred sites of these mystics and saints that I was coming across. One that compelled me was Mary Magdalene, the figure of Mary Magdalene. And I had a suspicion that she was more than the prostitute. You know, I wanted to understand her story more completely. So I went to 
the south of France. And at one point we went up to Spain to look at the ties between Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonna. And there's a Black Madonna in Montserrat, Spain. Um, the Black Madonna is, according to Marianne Woodman, she is about integrating those darkest aspects, you know, the things that have wounded and hurt us the most, but transmuting it into only more love. And um, so I became very interested in sort of the cult of the Black Madonna and understanding the Black Madonna. And I was there in Montserrat, Spain, and there was this hermitage, like up off the trail. Um, and I climbed up there and I was holding on to like the bars and looking in and the inside was literally at that time in my life all it's actually still all I want and all I feel like I need. It's like a blanket, a mattress, a little table and a chair um, and a candle. It's like, you know, what more could you need to go inward? Um, but so God, the, the woman I was traveling with, a mentor of mine, China Gollin, she took a picture of me looking into that hermitage and God was scratched on the door on the outside of the hermitage. And to me, when I saw that image, I was like, I was so struck by it. One, because God is in the detail. And, and, and two, because that to me was an image of my own personal journey. It's not to become more removed, right? It's not to, I, I, maybe I've done that in other lifetimes. Maybe we all have you know, gone, gone up on the mountaintop. And I mean, there's so many times I wish I could still do that. But I think the call of that image is that we're needed in the midst of everything. It's, it's how do we bring that mystical state of being in the heart of being in communion with the divine from within us down the mountain into the traffic into the darkest, most uh, challenging things that are happening in our world right now. Like, how do we bring that and integrate it into the everyday? That's that's what I realized is my my path and my process. Thank you. And 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 a part of your path and your process has to do with another one that I can't believe I'm going to say a more meaty Mother Mary. Exactly, a more meaty Mary. Yes, that's what one of the teenagers that I was working with um, suggested to me a, a pregnant teen also who had been assaulted, but, but got pregnant as, as a result of it. And, you know, she awoke me to the, I guess, you know, it was one thing to fight and to look for these images for myself when I realized that I could help someone else. Mm -hmm. It just, it took the flame from being contained to going like absolutely raging. Because when you see someone else suffering and the thought of, you know, that she might be able to feel again that love inside her in the way that I was by, by, by reconnecting to these stories that have always existed of the divine feminine, um, it just, it just, turned my the volume up on so then it wasn't just about me and my story it was about like wait now I need to share it now I need to share it and the meaty Mary was you know the Virgin Mary didn't the Virgin Mary made made her feel less holy like more like an outsider like how could she identify you know this young teen who had been raped and had you know been in this Catholic charities organization because her parents kicked her out and um you know how she couldn't identify with the virgin mary but you know when i started telling her stories about the black madonna when i told her stories about mary magdalene you know and it, it just she was like she really would only wanted to hear about a more meaty mary and it charged you know, it was like a charge it was like you go you know go and find this for me. And that's what I did. So that was what I focused on. All my, all my research was finding the meaty Mary, a more meaty Mary, right. An embodied divinity. Right. So let's, let's talk about, we're going to continue talking about your story a bit, but let's, let's talk about some of these, these women who come to the front here and, and what we can learn from them. First off the black Madonna. Yes. Yes. The black Madonna, the image of the black Madonna is, 
is very pa- powerful. That in, that particular Black Madonna is the Black Madonna of Einzeldown, Switzerland. Um, I actually had a red lady. That's my women's spirituality group. There was a red lady who went to Einzeldown re- recently and lit a candle. Um, that Black Madonna is known as Our Lady of the Hermits because there was a, a hermit named Meenrad um, who went there uh, it, and was there was an icon of her that he found and he um, he represented nourishing like his whole idea was to nourish the ravens like there are two ravens that you'll find painted on buildings in Einzeldown and on statues and those were Meenrad's ravens the ravens represent the darkness right? To not try to deny or, um, or transcend Mm -hmm. that darkness, but to actually be in it and then to integrate it. So the idea is like the only way out is through, you really have to, to go through it. Um, but then once you, you, you can alchemize it. So Periclesius, the great alchemist, was also there in Einzeldown, Switzerland, which is not an accident that he's there with the Black Madonna. Um, he was uh, an, a famous alchemist, and the whole idea of alchemy was to transform these base metals into unallied gold. But, but the spiritual idea of that is to continue to refine, you know, the base metals are these uh, ideas of ourselves are these things that have happened to us that keep us in this ego state, you know, like a climate of the ego that makes us feel like we're unworthy or we lack what we actually need or, and they're all of these rungs that sort of keep us from that holiest sanctum of the heart. And so the idea is to burn them away in order to live fully in the heart. And the, the Black Madonna of Einzelden, the ones that, that's pictured in the Divine Feminine Oracle, she is surrounded in these rays of just these clouds of gold. It is, it is so absolutely stunning. And when I, when I visited her um, on, on a pilgrimage I went to after Divinity School, um, it, the whole image and her the power of her uh, icon just brought me to my knees. And I, I asked in my heart when I was before her, uh, very lost with, with that challenge and that call of, you know, finding a more meeting Mary, like what, you know, what do I do? I, I prayed to her and I said, how do I love you more fully? And she said, love me more by loving you more fully. And I didn't really understand that until, um, I was writing the book, How to Love Yourself and Sometimes Other People with Lodro Rinsler. And I came to understand that really it's proportional. The amount I'm able to allow love to reach within me is the same that I'm able to allow my love to reach for humanity and and for the other people in my life. Like it's directly proportional. So the more the more I can forgive within myself is directly proportional to what I can forgive and what I can, you know, where I can allow that love to reach. It's directly proportional. So there is no separation really between the self and the other. So that statement of love yourself, you know, love your neighbor as yourself is so profound and and really is the answer to everything. If we could treat our own self, capital S you know, and honor this self just as every other self. I mean, it, it really is the one golden rule for a reason. Um, it's, it's very profound and, it's and true. The, it's the biggest challenge because it's, to love oneself is the, I'm not going to pick on modern religion, but in many ways, yeah. being born in original sin is the opposite of being exactly. told to love oneself. Exactly. Exactly. It sets us up for a dynamic of shame and unworthiness that that blocks us from being able to really receive that love that's already within us. That's inherent to us. It is it is ultimately the essence of what we are, of who we are. So I agree. And that's what I've come up against. Absolutely. With so many 
people that have read my work is that um, that idea that they're intrinsically unworthy of love, you know, and have to unlearn that. So many people that I've met in life, so many will argue and fight me and would would almost fight to the def- to the death to to defend why they're not worthy right right yeah how do we move past that well i think it takes that desire um one of the tapestries from the um middle age museum in france cuz i followed that you know, unicorn and the tapestries. Um, one of the tapestries says in Middle English, in Middle French, which means to my one desire. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that the desire for that love, for that divine love, it, all we need is that intention. All we need is that desire to want to feel more love or bring more love into our lives. And we begin to surround ourselves with the opportunities, even if it's just coming across, you know, this podcast, you know, for, for someone it's, it's that there's, it's a frequency, it's an energy, that intention, that desire sets, you know, sets a course, um, so that love becomes your guide, love becomes your weight beyond any, you know, religious tradition. What I like to say is that the women uh, uh, the female saints of, of gurus, mystics, poets that are a part of this oracle, the red thread that connects them is that from within their lifetimes, regardless of what, what oppressive, you know, situation they were in, they all had that desire to want to feel divine love, to want to experience and embody love. Um, and they all found different ways of being able to do that. And I, I think that that's what it takes. And then, you know, for each of us, the way to there is individual. It's a labyrinth. It, it's completely unique because each one of us has been, um, you know, influenced by religion or by things that negative things that have happened in our life like challenges that we have to integrate and figure out how to transmute, you know, into more love. Um, it's, it's all so different. Um, for me, it took finding the divine feminine. For me, it took finding these stories that relate an attribute of that vulnerability is our strength, right? That going inward is, um, the most revolutionary thing we could ever do because once we disengage with what other people are saying about us or what everybody else is telling us we need or who we are, it is such a revolutionary act to shut all of that down and place ourselves in, I like to put myself in a golden egg of light and just go inward and go into the heart and hear, and hear what the soul has to say and then be guided by that. (laughs) Woo. <laughs> Speaking about golden eggs, there's so many different directions I want to go with this, but but we had uh, we we started pulling cards last night, and my wife Jessica, she's the producer. She she pulled the first card, and it was this golden egg. Oh yeah, <laughs> the cosmic egg. What can you tell us about? And, and she's reading it. And she's going, "This is just so appropriate." <laughs> <laughs> so the. The golden egg is the, the cosmic egg is the 53rd card in the oracle. It's really the card that holds the entire oracle. And the reason why it's in the shape of an egg is because of the ancient symbol of the Vesica Pisces. So one of the most ancient symbols of the overlap of the divine feminine and the divine masculine or the human and the divine or the angelic and the human, whatever the male, female, however you want. So it's two circles overlapping and you get this egg-like shape. That's called the vesica I'll Pisces. I'll move my chair to the side for everybody on YouTube because <laughs> it's there and by that, my shoulder. And that Mary Magdalene is on the cover um, for, for the reason of that her story um, to me is, is, is very uh, powerful and timely right now 
Um, and that's, gospel. that's what I want to hear about. That's what I was going to ask yeah. about next, but you had brought up golden eggs. So I'm like, well, go to golden and then we've <laughs> got to hear the real story behind Mary. So the, the cosmic egg, just for that card, the frequency of it is this idea that we are always expanding in love, right? We, we are the energy, the frequency of what we are is participating in this evolution that ultimately is about our souls learning how to expand in love. And just like the universe is constantly expanding, which is like hard to wrap, but so are we. And we can fight it, you know, and we can do everything that, and we can refuse to try to evolve, but that the, the energy of the universe is moving in a direction of expansion, of expanding love. So that's the idea behind the, the cosmic egg is that idea that we are setting that intention, that desire to become only more love. And then with Mary Magdalene's story, what I found was that, no, she was not a prostitute. When I studied about her at both um, theological uh, seminary and, and also in divinity school was that she was not the prostitute. That was something that was created by the Catholic Church. Um, much, much later, beyond her story, um, before the fourth century, Mary Magdalene was understood to be an apostle to the apostle, which uh, Pope Francis has now rehabilitated her um, instead cool. of the pen yeah instead of the penitent prostitute, she is now officially the apostle to the apostles. Um, the egg in her story has to do with her own particular ministry, which began after. Um, Christ was crucified. Supposedly, she traveled to the court of Tiberius. She was a wealthy woman and uh, most likely supported Christ and, and his, the Christ movement. Um, and she went to the court of Tiberius Caesar, and she was bearing witness to how poorly Pontius Pilate had, you know, uh, doled out justice for for Christ, and and that she had witnessed his resurrection. Now, what she was trying, I think, to describe was a an ability to see him with a spiritual vision that we can acquire, mm -hmm. that can perceive others that have passed over, but that are they can be fully present. So there are many other mystics that who are in the oracle who also like St. Teresa of Avila, who had visions in 1515 of Christ when she was 44, um, that she said were so real. It was as if he was physically in bodily form standing before her, but she knew he was not. No one else could see him. But so it was the spiritual eye of the heart that she had acquired. And she talks about these seven stages that she went through, the seven mansions in the her masterpiece, The Interior Castle. The Gospel of Mary, which was something I studied and I'm writing about in a book now with Hay House, the Gospel of Mary also talks about seven stages. And it talks about being able to reach this state of seeing the resurrected body, right? Which may, may be the more, more accurately called the ethereal body mm -hmm. or the soul. And so when Mary was standing before Caesar and, you know, he said to her, supposedly, a body can no more resurrect. Like you couldn't have seen the resurrected Christ any more than that egg on the table turn red. So supposedly she picked up the egg and the egg turned red immediately. So that is still celebrated in the East, um, in the Christian East, in Byzantium. Mary Magdalene was understood to have been a master of what's known as the prayer of the heart. This was a practice that these uh, desert fathers practiced of going into the heart, these hesychists, they would go into the heart, bring all their consciousness into the heart and be able to be directly connected to the divine in a state of what they called theosis, which is uh, a state of perpetually being, though my heart is, though, though I am asleep, my heart is awake, right? So it's this idea that we can be in a constant live dialogue with the divine. And that's what I believe Mary Magdalene was able to achieve. And her gospel, which was buried, and um, there was an edict that went out shortly before the beginning of the fourth century for her gospel to be destroyed. 
So we only have fragments of it, but we have enough of it to know that it contains a dialogue that she had with Christ, where she asks him, when I see you in a vision, how is it that I'm seeing you? With what faculty can I perceive you? So it's a metaphysical text that really is giving us a, a pathway to being able to also acquire the spiritual eye of the heart. Woohoo! <laughs> I, I wasn't going to go there at all, but but it seems it seems <laughs> I- important. So we're since we're talking about being constantly in communication with the divine, we we teach yes. a we teach a course on automatic writing on how to journal oh, and beautiful. get this communication going. You've got this going on. Maybe you can tell us about it. <laughs> uh, so that the 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 method that I use, I started with. Uh, automatic writing that that's what I uh, began I I switched from black ink to red and I just would start you know I would start having this dialogue um, and I would receive these answers that just completely blew me away and at first I was convinced I was channeling some sort of crazy angel and then I I you know I realized that this was that love this is the voice of that love that I was feeling inside my heart. You know, this is me, the ultimate me, the most ancient self that I am, the I am that is, um, will survive any trial, you know, in this lifetime. So I, it was empowering and, and powerful and life changing to experience the answers, um, and to externalize them in a way through writing. Um, so I was writing in this red ink and, and receiving all these answers. And then when I came across the Hesychus in divinity school, I realized, wait, I can, I can also do this without the pen. Sometimes the pen is, I can't reach an answer without the pen. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I wanted to also experience w- was like moments of just being able to drop inward and, and sink into that love like a vat of honey and just hear and receive the answers that I needed. And so I I started practicing what I now call the soul voice meditation, which is what I wrote about in Reveal um, and How to Love Yourself. And the Divine Feminine Oracle, one of the many, many, many reasons I'm so grateful for it is that each of the ladies has a soul voice meditation um, question which is basically just an icebreaker Mm -hmm. for you and your soul to get started based on, you know, the energy of that saint or guru. It's just a question to go inward around. And then it's just, you know, you talked about going down a rabbit hole. I mean, that's it. It's like you just, you, you take the red pill and you just travel and you just listen and you receive and you, you remember then and you experience the truth that we contain our own answers. And it changes Everything. Everything. Amen. Everything. What can you tell us about Marguerite? Is it Porette or Porette? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought her up. So she's one of the other mystics, in addition to St. Teresa of Avila, who, you know, she's off in Spain. Mm -hmm. Marguerite Porette's in France. There's no internet, you know, there's no way that the two of them could ever be connected. And the Gospel of Mary had been buried for a millennia. Okay, and wouldn't be found for until the the nineteenth century. So, so Gospel of Mary's buried with the, those seven stages. Uh, there's no way Marguerite Porette could have known about Teresa of Avila. Marguerite Porette is a French mystic who, in the Middle Ages, wrote a book that I couldn't emphasize more. It, the spiritual masterpiece of it. It, it is is very sim. I mean, it's similar in stature to the interior castle. It's called the mirror of simple souls. And in it, she relates the way that again, the soul goes through a stage, seven stages of sort of in in the gospel of Mary, I like the way that she describes them as like climates, right? It's like climates of the ego, the way that the soul is bound to the ego. And there's a way in that within this world, we can free ourselves from it. So we are experienced heaven, heaven now, right? Heaven isn't something we have to earn or wait for. Heaven is something that's intrinsic inside of us and is already waiting for us within us. So her, her mystical masterpiece, um, The Mirror of Simple Souls, 
basically said, God is love and you are nothing except love, right? So there is no separation. And that the way to reach that state of union happens within you. So the reason she got burned at the stake and her book was burned as well was because then it was giving this message that the church isn't needed in order to write like we don't actually need to have our sins absolved because we do the inner work that reconnects us directly to the divine. And that was considered, uh, you know, a heresy and, and too threatening to, to the church. So she was burned at the stake and her masterpiece ha has been recovered and it is something you can buy. Um, but so the reason why I was excited you said that is, is because there is a lineage here that that seven, you know, the fact that it's seven and the fact that these women all reached the same conclusion, Mary, um, having followed what was clearly Christ's transmission, uh, St. Teresa from within her abbess in Spain in, as, as a Carmelite and Marguerite Poret as what was known as a, a Beguin in France, all of these saints reach the same conclusion that we are love that and our work here is is to embody that love Woohoo! <laughs> why am i getting goosebumps every time you say seven yes because i think that there's something intrinsic i think that that is it's a message it's it's almost like linking us i mean that's the chakras it's the there's something that is so profound and unifying something that transcends time and place and culture. Um, it's a truth. I think it's a, it's a truth. And I know that's why I get chills is it feels like a pathway that it's, it's in our blood. Like we'll find it. Like we'll, it's, it's somehow encoded in us, you know, the, this, this way. And, and, and and may it only become more clear now that the the gospel of Mary has been found. Now that these voices of these you know female saints have found it, is it, you know may it only become clearer that path and that seven that sacred seven. Awesome. I've I've had almost tears the whole interview, and to me, when I'm in a place of tears, that's not sadness. That's truth. That's joy. But it's 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 in alignment or congruence. Yeah. Maybe you can share with us real briefly ab about your deck how it came about and 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 how we best use this these are very very powerful souls in here so it 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 came about as you know these are my lady loves i mean that's how i refer to them these these are the stories the voices the deep medicine that that healed me you know th this is how i came back home to myself is through their stories and the diversity is because I wanted to find where these voices of the divine feminine have existed throughout all time in all different cultures and religions. And also, I wanted as many women as possible to be able to receive what, what in Sanskrit is referred to as darshan. It's seeing and being seen by the divine. Um, I believe that there is no spiritual hierarchy to the world, to existence. So we are all, all of us, like I am eye to eye with an angel. An angel's not above me or beyond me or outside of me. I'm going to connect with an angel from within me once I release those ideas that I'm beneath one. So the there was a, a, an intense purpose to having all of the ladies meet whoever is the reader eye to eye. And there was a purpose behind the representation of as much diversity as possible, because I believe we are all love. Um, and that includes the animal realm and all of the, the earth and the created world. Um, so that was um, an expressed intention. And then the, um, the reason why these particular ladies is also because they mirror this um, let me use the example of in Hedawana and in Anna. So in Anna is this ancient Mesopotamian goddess who was known as the goddess of heaven and earth. But then what happened in this oracle 
So this is the way my life works. I have a close friend who I created an event in New York with, with Eve Ensler, that was an event, you know, to heal. Um, at, and all these women came to speak and it was this amazing event. And this woman has a tattoo of Inanna. And then this, she had this other woman on her arm. Wow. And as I was doing this Oracle, I saw a vision as I was writing about Inanna, I suddenly had a vision of her tattoos and that work that we did. And we called it just love that event. And so I texted her. I was like, who is that other woman? Not Inanna, but the tattoo of the other woman. She goes, her name is Inhedawana, and she was the first priestess of Inanna. So I researched Inhedawana, who I'd never heard of before, and she is the first author in all of recorded history. Um, wow. her, her work, her, her poems, her temple hymns to Inanna, ha, ha, there were more inscriptions than the inscriptions of King. So basically it was like a New York, an ancient Mesopotamian version of a New York Times bestseller. Like her, her, her poetry influenced the, the Psalms in the Old Testament and they influenced the cadence of the Homeric epics. So like to me, this was, I mean, I, I can't even tell you how on fire I was when I learned about in Hedawana. So, but what, what ended up happening in this vision was kind of like a same sex divine feminine Noah's Ark. It was like, I saw in Inanna take the hand of the human woman in Hedawana, who was known to have reached semi-divine status because she embodied the love and the energy of Inanna. I saw the goddess Isis, known for healing and resurrection, take hands with Mary Magdalene because Mary Magdalene was known to embody the energy of Isis. So there's all these, and then the goddess Kuan Yin, the Buddhist goddess Kuan Yin, take the hand of Mao Shun, who was the reason of human incarnation of Kuan Yin and the reason why the depictions of Kuan Yin changed at some point during the, the Tang Dynasty from being masculine to feminine. Because there was an actual woman who people believe was actually an avatar of Kuan Yin. So the idea is, is, is kind of growing up our idea of what it means to be human, that we can actually be completely in alignment with the divine, you know, and completely in alignment with our own soul, which is the divine. And in that way, can move the story forward, right? Embody so that we are the presence of the divine here on earth while we're human. So that, that human divine, like it's all in there. <laughs> There's there's so much more I want to ask you. We we got to keep this kind of tight. There's all right. I, I need to get into some wrap up questions and then we do a brief meditation. Yeah. But before that, Jessica pulled one more card and I only got the first. I only remember the first name, but it, but she did think because Jessica's Chinese origin, um, it, it, she thought it was pretty cool that the next card she pulled was Joe, Z H O U. Yes, yes. So that um, Taoism had a a large. Uh, role in my life, studying Taoism, um, studying Buddhism in general, but Taoism in particular, because it's, it's, it's all about um, the Tao is this flow. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a very feminine force and it's a feminine way of being in the world that's water like, and yes. um, I'm all water. I'm a, I'm a Scorpio, like across the board. So I'm just, I have no earth. I'm all water. And when it so, comes to water. And I was thinking earlier when you were talking about this, I like to say gentle is the new strong. Gentle right. water exactly. moves mountains. Exactly. Think Grand Canyon. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, and think like one drop when added to a whole river become, you know, can, can change the world. So it's like, you know, but it's recognizing that drop of water that we are. It's the consciousness, you know. And so um, Taoism really, really moved me. And this idea that we can get into a flow um, where what we do is so in alignment, we can actually do nothing at all. There's, there's this, it's called Wu Wei, and it's this notion that of doing nothing. Yes. and the, And that there's this state we can reach where we are so in alignment with the force of the universe that we're, we're actually, we're not doing anything, meaning we're not willing, our, you know, our ego isn't 
willing us to try and try and try. And it's like swimming upstream. Instead, it's like we're floating and we're allowing the current of the universe to carry us towards what we're doing. And that's how I, I felt that happening in my life. I, I, I had such a physical experience of that at so many different points where it was like, um, I knew I was, I was doing what my soul was wanting to, me to do. And it was like, just, you know, getting in a river and being carried rather than having to force or manipulate anything to happen. So she was a Taoist poet and mystic. And I, I love this story of, um, you know, that she's one of the examples. There's actually many where the son becomes the first disciple, which I think is really beautiful. And we don't really, I guess I, I like that because that isn't something that we ordinarily necessarily, you know, that we hear. And, and there's, there's several stories. Of, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, well, and how sacred, how gorgeous that the masculine then holds and reveres the mother in that way. I guess that's what feels healing. Um, you know, that, that, that to me is the divine masculine is the, the masculinity that has integrated, um, the feminine and is in alignment and, you know, in balance with the feminine. So I love that story. Yes. And she, she is all about the peace, um, the river beneath the river, the, the peace that's at, at the depths always that we can tap into. More and more goosebumps. Woo! <laughs> so if, if I was to take off my, my coaching hat, Megan, I was to put it on you, what one homework assignment would you give people today so that they take action after they listen to this show? So what I always ask is just to take three breaths. Okay. So the soul voice meditation can be done for like hours, or you can literally do it in three breaths. And I'm, I'm going to, demonstrate right now how simple it can be. But this is the beginning of that revolution that we talked about, you know, of connecting inward to the heart and the way that it can change everything. So for me, all I do is, you know, we talked about that desire, the power of that intention. So I just set the intention with my first breath to go into the heart. I take that breath. With the second breath within the heart, I set the intention of connecting to the soul. I take that breath. And then with the third breath, I'm going to open my eyes again. And I'm now going to be seeing out with the eyes of the soul. So I take the third breath and I open my eyes again. And I'm letting love now lead me. And so just taking those three breaths at any point in the day, you can integrate it. I always like to say to my red ladies, you know, start with the three breaths with something that's already habituated, right? So do it while you're brushing your teeth or while you're... Um, Micro habits. Yes, exactly. While you're taking a shower. Don't set yourself up to then spiritually spank yourself, you know, because you're not doing this new thing or whatever. Like for me, it's... And because of my connection to the water, it's just easiest always to make sure I do it in the shower. I always do the three breaths in the shower. And if you have a strong imagination, you want to do something like what 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 comes to you is going to be the strongest, which is also why I don't um, suggest any particular way of reading the Oracle other than just to follow your own intuition. Um, but, you know, some, some ladies imagine going with the three breaths, going into the heart and like turning on a light, you know, or um, just giving their soul a fist pump. You know, you can use your imagination. It doesn't matter. But it's like this little sip, this little taste every day, whenever you need it. I mean, what I found is that I, I craved it more and more and more. And, you know, it eventually led to, um, as you witnessed, I, when I drop in, it's hard for me to come back up. Yes, it's I have seen this. To... <laughs> and we're supposed to do a guided meditation at the end. I'm a little concerned about this one. Yeah, I might not come back. So, because for me, it's just so delicious to be in that space. And, but it takes cultivating and it takes that desire to want to be led by love, you know, to want to experience more love in your life. Beautiful. On that note, what advice would you give? This is a question from Jessica specifically. What advice would you give parents or moms to help their kids today? So I, I am an indie mom and my son is eight and he, 
I mean, and it, it could be him, but from my experience, kids are just naturals at meditating. Just co- it's completely innate, just in the way that a kid can do a downward dog in a way that, you know, we have to be practiced yogis before we can reach. Um, for me, his imagination is, is still so wide open and so colorful and powerful. Um, we just use the soul voice meditation for him to anchor into his heart. He has anxiety and, um, you know, moments of fear. And we just together go into the heart. Sometimes he uses an elevator. He presses number seven and it goes down into his heart. Yeah. So it's like, just use, but, but follow their lead, like set up the framework to hold the space for them to go inward, but really just let them, their imagination is so profound and it's more fun for them if they can really color it with their own imagination and you know have an active role in it awesome so on that note what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what i call the woohoo factor i i would say daily experiences of entering into that cathedral in my heart that's you know i, I think once you start taking those sips you crave it in the same way that when you stop going to the gym, your body's like, Wah! you know, I think once you start practicing um, that stillness and that um, space of immense love, uh, nothing else, nothing else really uh, compares. Like there's no other, uh, there's no competition. Um, so I think that is, the the truest source of happiness for me is going inward and experiencing that love that is love that is love. I can't believe I'm bringing this up, but when you said nothing else compares, I now hear Sinead O'Connor know, singing about her. Well, it's but it's singing about her mother, in yeah. a sense that could be a divine mother. Nothing else right. compares to you. Right, 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 right. Well, there is, you know, I do think that there's truth in that it's a missing piece. You know, it's something that we search for in things outside of us and in people outside of us. But ultimately, until we turn on the lights of that cathedral in the heart, um, we, we won't be satisfied by, by the things outside of us. I so like it's the ultimate happiness, I think, an anchor. Woohoo! <laughs> on that note, talking about uh, uh, turning on the cathedral <laughs> light of your heart, <laughs> Where can people go to find your beautiful deck and to find out more? So it's on um, Amazon. You can buy it. And, and uh, the full list of where it's being sold is on my website. My name has an egg in it. So it's double G. And my last name is has two T's, double G, double T, MeganWaterson.com. There's a page with the information about the Divine Feminine Oracle and all the places it can be bought. Fantastic. So if you didn't catch Megan, two G's, two T's, is that correct? <laughs> MeganWaterson.com. Come on over to InspireNationShow.com. We'll get you over to MeganWaterson.com. This has been phen- phenomenal, Megan. A- anything last that you want to share with people today? Just that I feel this oracle is um, is timely. I, I it it I feel like it's resonating right now so profoundly. Um, the messages I've been getting as an author has been um, deeply moving and humbling, and I've been so profoundly grateful that um, it feels like something that was asked of me um, that came from it came from within my heart, but it seems to be an answer that. Um, you know, is fulfilling a need within the world right now. More tears. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. (laughs) (laughs) When I run out of words, you know you hit something (laughs) profound. Would you have time for a very brief meditation? Yes. So as I mentioned with, um, and your beautiful wife pulled the cosmic egg, let's imagine right now that we are sitting inside of a cosmic egg. So just imagine a full body halo from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. And that same golden light that is surrounding you and protecting you is also now moving swiftly through you. 
from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. It's pulling this golden light through your body and it's pulling out anything that's no longer serving you. So this egg is porous and everything right now that does not serve you any thoughts, energy, emotions, past experiences is leaving through the porousness of that egg, that golden light. And now, as anything prior to this moment drains out the soles of our feet, the golden egg is also porous to receiving all information that's in highest alignment with us, for us, in this present now, this moment, this heaven already inside us. We're going to take the first intentional breath, this intentional to enter the cathedral of the heart. Take this first breath collectively together. And we descend, which is an ascension, into the heart, into this mediator between the worlds, this mystical space that has always existed inside us. Then with the second breath, we intend to meet with that eternal aspect of us, the soul, the self, the aspect of us that goes on, the aspect of us that is a love, that is a holy fire here on earth. And in this space, always we know we can receive any question, the answer to any question, the vision of any answer we need or the emotion, the sensation of what we need in this moment. We can receive what we need from within this space of the heart. Connecting with the soul is this symbol. What's difficult is believing that we are this worthy to such proximity of the divine. Then we give gratitude because we know that even if we didn't receive the answer or the vision or the feeling sensation that we needed in this moment, we will. What is asked in the heart is answered. It just may come in soul time and Kairos time. It might come when we are actually ready to receive it. And it may come on a billboard or a t-shirt or on a TV show we happen to tune into. We will know the answer because we will feel it. We will feel the light turn back on in this cathedral in our heart. And we will know that that answer is meant for us. So we give gratitude that it was set up this way that we are each our own sanctuary, that this beloved body is our soul's chance to be here. We give gratitude for this opportunity to evolve the soul. And we take this third breath now to surface from behind our eyes with the vision of love. And we allow love to guide us now for the rest of the day. (laughs) <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. <laughs> <laughs> wow megan thank wow. you thank you for that opportunity and thank you for this conversation you hold beautiful space <laughs> thank you <laughs> and i love the work and the mission you're on i was supposed to be looking at a deck of cards and I was blown away and I went into your book and was blown away and and I'm like Jessica you have got to read this <laughs> so thank you so much for the work you're doing in the world when it's not often I get tears it happens but not often I get tears in the show it means you are so on path so on fire and what you're sharing is so important today thank you Thank you for all your red. (laughs) 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 So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the divine feminine, and begin diving into your own cathedral of your heart and shine bright. Woohoo!
Thank you so, so much, Megan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank your wife for me. Will do. I'm, I'm grateful my work resonated with her. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>